I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 20th, 2010, I'm interviewing Dr. Delbert Fisher for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at the San Diego Convention Center. Dr. Fisher, would you tell me a little bit about your family background? When did your ancestors first come to California? They came, uh, I'm a fourth generation Californian. My great grandmother came to California in the mid 1800s and settled in uh, Placerville. Uh, she uh, had been married before and uh, married uh, once more uh, in Placerville to Jacob Fisher. And they, uh, my father uh, was uh, the second of their children. Uh, and uh, he married uh, Thelma Johnson, uh, also from the Placerville area. Uh, they uh, had uh, three children, four children, excuse me, myself and uh, two brothers and a sister. And so we're the third, the fourth generation of the, of the family. They, uh, the family members first came to uh, Philadelphia uh, and settled in uh, western Pennsylvania uh, in the late 1700s. My mother's uh, family uh, were second generation Californians and were from Switzerland. So my great grandmother was German. My uh, grandmother was Swiss and Jacob Fisher uh, I think was English. And so we're mostly German, English and Swiss. Did you discuss your family background with your, fa with your parents as you were growing up? Was that like a big part of your family? Uh, no. Uh, that's all information that we've been accruing, my siblings and I, over the past uh, four or five years. One of my uncles uh, uh, decided to collect some family history, and so it's been recently interesting. What did your mother and father do for a living when you were growing up? They were uh, high school graduates. Uh, my father uh, initially worked for the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, uh, running uh, one of the powerhouses on the American River. And uh, at, that was my first home, actually, after it, when we came from, from uh, Placerville, uh, after uh, I was born. Then uh, siblings were born there. Uh, my father moved from there to uh, back to uh, Diamond Springs, which is three miles, it's a suburb of Placerville, and started a grocery store. And so we had the grocery store experience and I worked in the grocery store when uh, I was in grammar school there. What type of education did you have? I went to grammar school in Diamond Springs. There was one school and uh, there were, it's a uh, Placerville was about 10,000 people. Diamond Springs uh, maybe was 2,500, maybe, maybe more now. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald was the, was the teacher who I had most of the time or much of the time in grammar school. Uh, I suppose there were 50 of us in the school, maybe 60. Uh, so it was small time, uh, small town uh, environment that I grew up in. What was it like growing up at, at the end of the Depression and during World War II? We didn't, uh, at the time, think that anything was unusual. I mean, there was uh, there was a lot of rationing of uh, shoes and getting tennis shoes and, uh, and uh, tires and uh, gasoline and uh, a constant recognition that uh, 
there was a problem somewhere, but uh, in, in our day-to-day -day lives, it made little difference. Uh, what kind of a student were you? Uh, I was usually a nerd, even in grammar school. Uh, and I went on to high school, and I went from Placerville to El Dorado County High School. Uh, I'm sorry, I went from Diamond Springs to El Dorado County High School in Placerville by bus uh, for uh, until I graduated from high school uh, and uh, headed off to Berkeley. Uh, my father, uh, the family, then moved to Placerville. And uh, so uh, the, about the time I left that area of the country and went to Berkeley to high school, uh, uh, the family had moved to Placerville and uh, I was my communication with them then uh, was, uh, was uh, based on visitations and summers. When did you decide that you might like to become a physician? I guess it wasn't something that acutely happened. Uh, I knew a, a young physician in uh, Placerville, Dr. Sirocco, uh, and I initially uh, was Im impressed because he drove around in a nice convertible which was certainly unusual in that area. And uh, we became acquainted and talked, and uh, I, uh, I had an episode of appendicitis and went to the hospital and uh, had some other associations. And uh, so I was intrigued by, uh, by medicine and, and, uh, and talking with him. And so that was probably my first inkling about that kind of a, of a way forward. Why did you choose to attend the University of California at Berkeley? There was never a choice. I mean, the, the assumption was that uh, that was where you'd go if you couldn't afford to go to Stanford. Uh, and UCLA was uh, yet to be developed, uh, and USC uh, was considered uh, an athletic and not an academic kind of uh, environment, and uh, uh, that wasn't an option. So uh, I just assumed uh, that I'd be going to uh, Berkeley. Uh, what was your major? Medical science. From day one, uh, it was, uh, and that turned out to be a. Uh, a three-year program because I entered uh, the uh, University of California Medical School as a senior student. It was the last year the, the medical students in the first year spent their time in the Berkeley campus in the basic science departments. Uh, so it seemed my life was kind of programmed uh, from the start. I assumed I'd go to Berkeley, and uh, uh, the medical science turned out to be the right place, and uh, I moved quickly uh, to, uh, to medical school on the same campus. Uh, it was Phi Beta Kappa. Which of your mentors in medical school would you say had the greatest impact on you? I, uh, well, it'll be Don, Donald Pickering, there's no question about that. Uh, I met him uh, in the late uh, second year, after we were then in San Francisco, and he was looking for somebody to, uh, especially a student, to help him take care of a monkey colony that he built there. Uh, which was intriguing, and uh, we visited and talked, and uh, so I went to work taking care of his uh, infant monkeys, uh, small monkey colony, uh, and uh, it became a lifetime friendship. And uh, a prolonged period of, uh, of interaction with him uh, through my time at the University of Oregon. How did you become interested in pediatrics 
endocrinology and the thyroid. Well, Donald Pickering was a pediatrician and an endocrinologist. One of the few uh, endocrinologist uh, pediatricians uh, uh, evolving in the, in the area in the United States. Uh, Lawson Wilkins on the East Coast, of course. Uh, uh, Dr. Pickering was one of the few initial academic pediatric endocrinologists in the country uh, in the West Coast. Uh, and pediatrics just went with it. I mean, they hadn't thought they were separate. So it was that, it, that first experience uh, when you were working with him and working with the infant monkeys, that, was that like an uh, immediate reaction or that you were going to be a pediatric endocrin endocrinologist, or did it kind of grow? Well, working with Don Pickering and the, and the uh, monkeys uh, was a, a really exciting time. Uh, he was developing this monkey colony uh, because he wanted to use infant monkeys as a surrogate for infants to do endocrine studies. And he had been at Yale and uh, he had met Gertrude Van Wagenen uh, who had a monkey colony and so she had agreed to send him infant monkeys uh, and they came by airplane and one of my activities, jobs, was to pick the infant monkeys up at the airport. And sometimes they'd come in on the weekends and uh, they'd be dehydrated and uh, I'd have to take them back to the apartment and uh, give them fluids. And uh, uh, my wife was a little disconcerted with that, uh, but she became a monkey nurse as well. And uh, so <clears throat> I was really pretty involved with, with what was going on and gradually learned about the research that was going on. Uh, initially, I was, it was just a way to make some extra money uh, and it became uh, much more than that. And uh, there were four principals involved. Uh, Dean Francis Scott Smith, uh, head of pediatrics, was uh, involved. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, one of the radiologists uh, in the school was involved and uh, the head of the radioisotope uh, lab uh, was involved and uh, so they all became mentors uh, as we proceeded uh, obviously as a junior partner in that research project. And what were you doing in that project? Uh, we were, well the, the basic uh, program was to uh, eliminate uh, the thyroid gland uh, from the infant monkeys after they were born and they'd become hypothyroid and then to follow them to see uh, what happened to them uh, and <clears throat> we measured their chemical changes in the blood, we measured their, their, the changes in their uh, growth rate, uh, we measured the changes uh, uh, in uh, their uh, their brain weight, uh, <clears throat> the uh, looking for uh, uh, the signs and symptoms that you usually see in hypothyroid infants. Uh, so uh, the skeletal changes were studied using uh, x-ray uh, and the changes were all outlined. Uh, so it was a rather comprehensive project. Now, you got married around this time? I met my wife uh, in Berkeley. Uh, we had a, a, a dinner uh, with the Gamma Phi Beta sorority. Uh, and each of us had reluctantly attended that uh, and met, uh, and it turned out that she was from uh, th uh, the Mother Lode area, 30 miles from Blasherville, uh, in the, in the south, next south uh, uh, 
I have, have for a word on counties, excuse me. She, she was from uh, Amador County. Uh, we had a very similar background. Her mother ran a grocery store, uh, and uh, she was an only child, and uh, the mother, her mother was divorced. Uh, she, we, turns out we were registering for Berkeley in the same long line at, at the same time that we went to Berkeley. Uh, we hit it off really well and quickly, and uh, so uh, she was, uh, <coughs> got her bachelor's degree uh, uh, in uh, speech and uh, psychology. Uh, she got a teaching credential. Uh, and uh, we were married uh, in January of my sophomore year. Uh, she got a job uh, in, the, in the San Francisco Unified School District, and we moved back to San Francisco. Uh, we were married in January, and she went to work uh, in February. Uh, and uh, we'll have our 60th anniversary this January. Why did you choose to do your internship and residency at University of California, San Francisco? I didn't consider anything else. Don Pickering was there, and uh, what we were doing, uh, the research with the monkeys, uh, uh, and our growing personal relationship. Uh, and I stayed and did the first two years of residency there until I was drafted. Uh, you were drafted in 1955 into the uh, United States Air Corps? Yes. Uh, what were your duties then? I was sent to uh, West Texas at Laughlin Air Base. Uh, it was a training base, uh, a gunnery training base. Uh, I was uh, the pediatrician for the, for the uh, group. There were seven of us actually. Uh, uh, two internists, a urologist, a couple of surgeons, and a, a practicing uh, physician uh, older from Texas. Uh, and each of us kind of did our, and, and, and most of us had partial training, and we weren't certified in our specialties. Uh, but we uh, considered ourselves uh, specialists there and, and uh, kind of divided the patient requirements and, and their needs and the, the clinic visits uh, uh, so that uh, at least we got to practice our specialty areas. How did you come to be an Irwin Memorial Fellow and Chief Resident in Pediatrics at the University of Oregon? Don Pickering had gone back to, uh, uh, had, had decided to, not gone back, decided to leave uh, the University of California and San Francisco, uh, and Mu had, had a had a an offer he couldn't refuse, I guess, uh, to uh, move the monkeys uh, to uh, Portland, uh, and uh, the NIH was interested in setting up a primate research center, uh, and I don't know the details of of all of the negotiation and and how. Uh, how the NIH uh, negotiated with the university, uh, and uh, and Don was the director, though, uh, and uh, it was one of the first uh, primate research centers uh, that the NIH supported in the country. Uh, he called uh, one day and asked if I was interested in in coming to Portland uh, and uh, continuing our relationship. Uh, and I enthusiastically took him on. Uh, we'd had uh, our first child, uh, Beverly and I, in Del Rio, where we were in, this, in the Air Force. Uh, David uh, was born uh, in 1956. Uh, so there were three of us when we moved back to Oregon. Uh, David, uh, went on to uh, uh, graduate from uh, UC San Diego and get his MD degree at UC Irvine and became an, an 
orthopedic surgeon, uh, uh, and he was in Santa Barbara. He, uh, he, his hobby was racing cars. He was a race car driver uh, affiliated with the, with the uh, SCCA, the Sports Car Club of America. And uh, he had a BMW that he raced, and the club, of course, helped him move around from one place to another. Uh, and in 2001, he was uh, the group was racing in uh, in Phoenix, and uh, on Saturday afternoon he was in the final preliminary race and and uh, tragically died as his something happened and the, he hit the wall. What feature or features marked your time at the University of Oregon? Well, the first important uh, event was the delivery of twins into the family. Uh, Thomas uh, and Mary, they weren't identical twins. Uh, that they were born in 1958. Uh, Tom uh, went on to UC San Diego and, and, and got his physics degree and went on to get an MBA and uh, is now a an systems analyst for Qualcomm here in San Diego. Uh, Mary uh, got her BA from Berkeley uh, and uh, tried a couple of, uh, of uh, jobs uh, and uh, more recently uh, married and he's now uh, managing a, a blended family uh, with with four children so she ha and, and she's now approaching uh, obviously age 50 so she's got her hands full but doing a terrific job and what about uh, research that you were doing we continued Don and I to, to uh, do some uh, monkey work. Uh, the most important uh, change for me was uh, the first year as a chief resident. I, that was my third year of pediatric training and I was a chief resident uh, there uh, and that, that was pretty time consuming, coordinating the activities of the resident staff. Uh, I was involved with uh, teaching and patient care as well. Uh, raising uh, the new family. Uh, we lived in a two-story house with the, uh, the only bathroom downstairs, and the bedrooms upstairs. Uh, taking care of two small children was, for my wife, a bit difficult. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> it was a rather heavy schedule, uh, trying to do the work with a research group as well, but uh, I had exposure to the laboratory. There were, uh, I had a good friend uh, who I worked with uh, and learned uh, to measure thyroid hormones and do a variety of laboratory kinds of, of testing. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, I became interested in fluid electrolyte metabolism uh, as uh, in San Francisco as well as at the University of Oregon uh, in treating the, the children. Uh, and so Dr. Picker and I uh, wrote our first book, Fluid and Electrolyte Therapy, uh, a unified approach that published by the University of Oregon Press. And uh, so that was great fun working with him. And I, that was my first uh, rather extensive writing uh, activity, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, actually, we wrote uh, two other uh, papers, uh, uh, one uh, therapeutic concepts relating to hypothyroidism uh, in childhood, and that was published in the Journal of Chronic Diseases, and uh, that was uh, an exciting event for me at the time. Uh, uh, we also, well, the, in, the, other, the other one was, was infantile hypothyroidism, uh, diagnosis and treatment, and that was published in the pediatric clinics of uh, North America. Uh, the, uh, 
from my work in the laboratory, I got involved uh, with uh, the Department of Obstetrics, and Dr. Dr. Benson was the chair of uh, obstetrics, uh, and so uh, he and Don and I uh, were doing a study on thyroid function in pregnancy uh, that uh, we finally published, uh, and that. Uh, that turned out to be a, a uh, one of the earlier papers that was published using uh, the butanol extractable method to measure iodine and uh, uh, measure thyroxine, excuse me. Uh, and so there was limited information when we did that, but otherwise it wasn't a terribly impressive publication. How were you recruited to the medical school faculty of the University of Arkansas as, as, an, as an assistant professor and director of pediatric endocrinology and metabolism? Well, my, my time uh, at Oregon uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, salary was coming to an end. I had the salary from the university for the residency and uh, I had an Irwin Memorial Fellowship uh, that Don had acquired uh, from uh, outside sources, and that was uh, a two-year support. So at the end of that, uh, I had to find a job, and uh, Don and I were looking at options around the country for uh, a job, uh, academic job uh, in uh, pediatric endocrinology. Uh, there were two came up, one at Yale and uh, one at the University of Arkansas. And I visited both. Uh, the Yale uh, option uh, didn't turn out to be very interesting. And the University of Arkansas did. Uh, Dr. Panos uh, had come from the University of Texas to uh, head the department. Uh, Dr. Robert Ebert was chairman of medicine. Uh, James Melby was there uh, in uh, heading endocrinology and medicine. Uh, Dr. Flanagan was there heading uh, uh, nephrology and medicine and heading a clinical study center. Uh, they were interested, and Dr. Panis was interested in uh, getting a research program going in pediatrics. Uh, uh, I uh, met also a Dr. Thomas Adi, who uh, was a radiation physicist heading the radioisotope department, and uh, he was uh, interested in thyroid research. And so we rapidly got together, uh, uh, and I was introduced to him on my visits. Uh, and Dr. Panis, uh, in addition, uh, offered me a research space in a brand new research building that had been constructed. Uh, so it was almost a no-brainer to uh, decide to, to go down there. Uh, it, uh, I've never regretted that decision. Uh, it was an interesting time in Arkansas, however, uh, and it, and of course, in 1964, uh, the civil rights legislation was passed. Um, there was a lot of, of uh, civil rights activity going on in, in Arkansas at the time. My wife got involved uh, in a lot of that. Uh, it, uh, and there were some dramatic changes between 1964 and 1968 when we left. Uh, so it was an environment uh, in, in terms of civil rights that we'd never been exposed to before. And uh, it uh, learned a lot and hope we accomplished something. What studies did you uh, work on with Dr. Adi? We, we uh, it was early in the radioisotope era. There, were, there wasn't much in the way of isotopes available before World War II. Uh, 
and of course radioiodine became available in, and for the treatment of hyperthyroidism. Uh, <coughs> we used it to ablate the thyroids in the infant monkeys we had, but uh, hadn't had much other experience. Uh, Dr. Adi had built a whole body counter, uh, which was created by and shielded by battleship uh, steel so that no radiation from outside could uh, penetrate to, to the radiation detectors. Uh, so uh, we were looking at iodine kinetics. Uh, we'd give a dose of radioiodine to the patient and uh, follow them over a period of time to, uh, to measure the disappearance uh, and uh, the accumulation in the thyroid and the excretion in urine. Uh, and uh, we're able to characterize pretty clearly iodine metabolism in adults. Uh, uh, we, uh, it, the, the radiation dose was, was minimal and they all, all those patients were, uh, were consenting to what they were doing. Uh, we also decided then to look at thyroid hormone kinetics and disappearance and metabolism. So. We, it was radioiodine labeled thyroid hormone. Uh, I mean, thyroid hormone, thyroxin, has four iodine atoms on the molecule. And so you make one of them radioactive and you could follow it just as you would radioactive iodine. And uh, we'd give a dose of, of uh, labeled thyroid hormone, uh, either thyroxin or uh, triadothyronine, the two active hormones, and could measure the disappearance rate over time, uh, correcting for some vagaries that, that are associated with it. Uh, but uh, this was, these were the first studies of uh, thyroxin uh, metabolism uh, in, uh, in uh, human adults that, that we were aware of uh, and were able to publish a paper about uh, production rates for thyroxin. Uh, also became interested uh, in, uh, in uh, the interaction of iodine uh, intake uh, and thyroid hormone function, of course. Uh, the iodine is ingested, it's picked up by the thyroid gland, uh, uh, and uh, if you're iodine deficient, uh, it picks up more iodine. So we showed a nice correlation of average iodine intake and radioiodine uptake. And uh, Dr. Adi then recruited uh, information from his friends around the country about the radioiodine uptake and the average uptake in, in various areas of the country. Uh, and uh, he was also a pretty expert mathematician and had a mathematician uh, who he worked with. And so uh, uh, we published a paper on uh, average iodine intake in the country, the first that was uh, created to, uh, to look at it in that way, uh, and uh, reported uh, that uh, the iodine intake was uh, in selected parts of the country really quite high. Uh, presumably because uh, they had put iodine in, in bread, of course, but uh, uh, that had the, the people concerned about uh, iodine and uh, thyroid metabolism uh, looking in ar around the country at uh, whether there, we were getting too much radioiodine, uh, too much non-radioiodine. Uh, we studied then uh, thyroid function in, in infants and uh, that was quite a surprise. Uh, in the laboratory, uh, I had uh, three technicians, and we were, and a, a uh, grant from the NIH uh, and a, a career development award from the NIH. Uh, we spent the time in the laboratory developing uh, improved methods to measure thyroxin uh, a little more carefully and uh, 
Dr. Van Middlesworth in, in, in Memphis had done some studies in, uh, in infants to show, and he'd done some radio uptake studies, ion uptake studies in the, in the thyroid. Uh, so we created a, a radio iodine detection device that, that we could uh, detect radio iodine in the thyroid gland of very, very small quantities. And, and did some uh, few radioiodin uptake studies uh, with permission of the, of the parents uh, to confirm Dr. Van Middlesworth's work. And uh, yes, they had high radioiodin uptake, which we had no reason to suspect. Uh, they also had high levels of thyroxine, which we didn't suspect. Uh, and tried to figure out why they were hyperthyroid. Uh, and these were normal infants. Uh, <clears throat> we, by accident, uh, looked at some of the infants uh, that were, being in, were in incubators and they had lower levels of thyroid hormone than those that were outside the incubators. And so we did a study to see if it was cooling in the extrauterine environment that caused uh, this hyperthyroidism. And it turned out they were quite different. If they were incubated, uh, their thyroid hormone levels were lower than if, if they were uh, outside and cooler. Uh, so we thought maybe it was TSH being stimulated uh, because of exposure to the extrauterine environment, but we couldn't measure TSH. Uh, but Dr. O'Dell at the NIH had developed a method to measure TSH. And about that time, uh, I had a call from uh, Dr. Joseph St. Jim in, at UCLA asking if I was interested in a pediatric endocrinology job at, uh, at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in, in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I visited. And uh, it was kind of like visiting Arkansas. It was a no-brainer. Uh, Dr. O'Dell had been recruited about the same uh, in a year before uh, by Dr. S David Solomon in the Department of Medicine to head uh, adult endocrinology. And uh, he uh, was interested in in uh, in what we were doing and. Uh, Joseph St. Jim uh, had just been recruited uh, to head the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, it was a small department. It was a, US, a, a, a uh, L.A. County uh, public hospital at the time. And UCLA had a contract uh, with Harbor to uh, uh, provide the medical faculty. Uh, and UCLA was interested because uh, uh, it was an excellent place for junior medical students to do their their medical training, uh, and uh, it was uh, a desirable uh, internship and residency uh, hospital site uh, for for new physicians uh, because uh, they they had a chance to be really involved in patient care. Uh, and, and that was before uh, that the supervising university physicians had to, to uh, put notes in the chart and document everything that had been done. Uh, there was also uh, a, a several research buildings available that were old, old barracks from a World War II uh, Embarkation Hospital, uh, and there were 40 buildings uh, on the site of the Harvard Hospital, uh, and the university, uh, I'm sorry, the County of Los Angeles had had uh, taken over the hospital after the war, for, uh, paid a dollar for it, and built a seven-story uh, hospital uh, to go with the barracks. Uh, so we had a huge uh, uh, area of potential research space. Uh, 
Dr. Solomon had been, David Solomon had been recruited uh, from UCLA to head the department down there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Odell had, had brought uh, Stan Corenman with him from the NIH. Bill Odell and, and, and uh, Stan Corenman and uh, Dr. Solomon, who was also uh, a, an endocrinologist interested in the thyroid, uh, uh, and, and I and, and Dr. St. Jim thought it would be a good idea to have a combined medicine pediatric uh, and, and endocrine unit. Uh, and we discussed uh, the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, obviously, it would be efficient. Uh, and internists could learn about uh, children and children could learn about adults and uh, that was that would provide more effective endocrine training. Uh, it would, uh, we could combine efforts uh, for funding from the NIH and research. Uh, we could, we could uh, more efficiently deal with the teaching uh, and the inpatients and the outpatient services uh, uh, and even perhaps uh, provide more time uh, for, uh, for research than we would have if we were having to run this single department uh, exclusively. So that was done, uh, and uh, all the research was, was combined as well. Uh, it it uh, turned out to be uh, pretty effective. What was the ethos of the Harbor UCLA uh, at the time? Well, that was another of the enticing reasons to uh, to move there, uh, everybody was interested at that time in collaboration. It was a rather small uh, uh, faculty. Uh, at that time, there were eight or ten faculty in pediatrics and probably twice that in medicine. And uh, Dave Solomon and, and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. St. Jim started recruiting uh, and built rather large departments. Uh, much of this was uh, with uh, county funding uh, and uh, the South Bay area in Los Angeles uh, was, uh, uh, the, the population was increasing uh, such that uh, the clinic space uh, became uh, tight uh, and the, they that uh, eventually had to be expanded, uh, but uh, the patient care needs uh, of the county uh, were growing and they were willing to grow the departments. Uh, and uh, that happened uh, pretty quickly, actually. And uh, we, uh, as we combined uh, the department, the divisions and, and the department activities, uh, uh, we uh, expanded our NIH funding and uh, got training grants uh, and started recruiting fellows to embellish the, the endocrine division uh, and the other departments were doing the same thing, uh, building their, their, their departments and building their uh, research activities in, in the barracks. And a re research and educa education institute uh, was set up uh, to run the barracks. Uh, and it was fairly easy uh, with those rather simple barracks to modify the space and create work uh, research workspace. Uh, and uh, they managed the grants uh, from the NIH. and. Uh, uh, it be, the Research and Education Institute uh, became a pretty large operation. Uh, it, it's now the LA Biomedical Institute uh, that's still functioning and running uh, that area. And they're now uh, one, two, three, and uh, and some other planned uh, research buildings real research buildings, not barracks. There are a few barracks still there, but it's still evolving uh, as we had tried to put it together. What assays were being developed? 
Well, Bill O'Dell was interested in, in pituitary hormones and uh, Stan Corman in uh, estrogen and testosterone and the steroid hormones. Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Solomon was interested in thyroid, as I was. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the the plan, uh, at, at least in my mind, uh, was to exploit the immunoassay technology, uh, which was new. Uh, Burson and Yallen had Yallow, Rosalind Yallow, had uh, developed this research uh, option, uh, radio immunoassay. Uh, late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, Solomon Burson died uh, and, and Rosalind got the Nobel Prize uh, for that. Uh, it was new technology. Uh, the NIH was very willing to fund it. Uh, we recruited fellows who were interested because it was also a tremendous opportunity for them to learn a whole new technology. And uh, so uh, I thought it was useful to exploit the technology uh, to uh, characterize fetal and newborn thyroid function. Uh, and the endocrine systems ontogenesis uh, Bill O'Dell was interested in some of that as well, uh, and to recruit collaborators and fellows uh, to characterize various endocrine systems. Uh, and that would increase the, the options for funding uh, if we had a program that looked at more than just thyroid function and looked at other areas of endocrine systems development, uh, we could expand the funding. So over the three to four years, we evolved uh, four teams in, in the pediatric section uh, uh, to look at uh, thyroid uh, and uh, vasopressin uh, was another uh, and uh, insulin and glucagon and carbohydrate metabolism was another and uh, then later uh, looking at growth factors. Uh, and uh, we recruited uh, uh, and the four teams were each comprised of five to eight people uh, and a lot of interaction and a lot of interaction with medicine uh, fellows as well uh, and uh, this uh, this worked I guess so well that over 25 years uh, we published 350 papers uh, and, uh, and uh, as well as review publications uh, dealing with uh, endocrine systems onogenesis. Uh, Bill O'Dell and the endocrine uh, group in medicine uh, were very productive uh, as well uh, and we exchanged uh, methodology and, uh, and uh, uh, information and expertise uh, and it was quite an exciting place. Actually we, we presented the first uh, Endocrine Society uh, radioisotope workshop uh, in the 1960, early 1960s, and Rosalind Yallow uh, came as one of the faculty, uh, and uh, that was highly successful, and that uh, helped to advertise uh, our program, uh, and uh, so we had plenty of fellowship applications. Uh, would you talk a little bit about? Uh, newborn screening and, and how you got into that f with all the knowledge you were gaining at the time about thyroid system ontogenesis? Uh, remember the, uh, this, the hypothesis was that TSH was stimulating these newborns to be hyperthyroid and uh, Bill O'Dell had a TSH assay that he brought with him from the NIH uh, so one of the first publications, he and I, was to look at TSH in the newborn. And it turned out that uh, they had a TSH surge, we called it, uh, and the levels went up from about 10 in the cord blood to uh, 70 or 80 within an hour after birth. 
uh, it stimulated the thyroid to release uh, uh, thyroid hormones, uh, and over the next two to three days, the thyroid hormone levels became very elevated. Uh, they were hyperthyroid, and then they, uh, the, the TSH surge uh, subsided over the subsequent uh, week, and the hyperthyroid state subsided uh, progressively over uh, the first month. Uh, it, uh, it was in part due to cooling. Uh, we didn't have to repeat those studies. Uh, it, uh, umbilical cord cutting also triggered, the, helped trigger this response. Uh, and there were obviously some chemical changes involved as well. Uh, but we went on to, to characterize uh, the changes in T4 levels, thyroxine and triterthionine levels, uh, and TSH levels, uh, and uh, we proceeded to develop a, a, a newborn uh, uh, research kind of plan where we could study infants in the hospital and study fetal sheep. Dr. Hobel and the Department of Obstetrics uh, had uh, been interested in, in the studies uh, in, in, in fetal sheep as an obstetrician. And they were interested in delivery and those kinds of things. Uh, and Dr. Manulides uh, was in the Department of Pediatrics interested in, in, thyro in, in heart function and uh, was working a little bit with the sheep. Uh, and so we, we got NIH grant funding to build a, a really significant uh, fetal sheep operation research-wise. And the Research and Education Institute initially funded part of that, and then the NIH funded it, uh, and uh, the obstetric people uh, were using it. Uh, uh, and we in introduced uh, studies then in fetal sheep. Uh, we couldn't uh, to find to get access to uh, the newborn infants uh, was difficult in a public hospital. Uh, Dr. George Bray uh, was there uh, in the Department of Medicine and had recruited uh, he and Dave Solomon a a NIH clinical study center, and but it wasn't appropriate to study infants. And so Dr. St. Jim and, and Dr. Solomon and Dr. Bray and the endocrine group uh, and the neonatal group got together again and, and uh, decided that uh, we could create a, a, uh, a separate uh, perinatal research center, if you will, uh, that wasn't geographic, but would be wherever the the infants were and wherever the, the pregnant women were and the and the NIH agreed to boost the budget a little bit and provide uh, nurses and support people to study the infants and the mothers in the hospital and so we were able to do studies uh, clinical studies in patients and able to do uh, more complicated studies in the fetal sheep and uh, so in the first uh, three years that, uh, that, that we were at Harbor, uh, we developed uh, information about uh, what was really going on uh, during the last uh, weeks of life in the uterus, uh, the sheep, and uh, in both human and, and sheep, what was going on in terms of thyroid function in the newborn period. Uh, and. Uh, We'd characterized the neonatal hyperthyroid state, the TSH peak, the increase in T4 and T3. Uh, and my background interest uh, since uh, I'd been exposed years before to the congenitally hypothyroid infants was maybe we could screen for them. Uh, because uh, if they were, they were born and they, uh, on their own, and they were relatively rare, about one in three to four thousand newborns. 
So nobody was used to looking for them or caring for them. And so, and they didn't have much in the way of signs and symptoms. And so they, they were hypo, hypothyroid uh, and uh, treatment was delayed uh, usually three to six months, uh, at which time uh, they had lost uh, about three to five points of IQ a month over that period. So it was a, an important cause of, uh, of uh, congenital uh, uh, mental deficiency. And uh, uh, Dr. Dusso became interested uh, in, in this. Uh, and uh, he was going back to Quebec uh, in 1971. He was an internist, by the way, not a pediatrician and uh, had come uh, to Harbor to work with Dr. Solomon, an, an internist, and, uh, and he found out what, what we were doing in the newborn period, and uh, he was interested in T3 metabolism, and so he joined our group, uh, and that happened several times, uh, so that uh, the people who came as fellows uh, got to choose from among several options in terms of research opportunities that they had, and he was the first to do that. Uh, the second fellow I had was Dr. Skowski, uh, and he was an internist as well, and uh, he was interested in, in water metabolism and vasopressin. And so, uh, and Dr. Chopra was a fellow working with uh, Dr. Solomon. He, he was a, a, a fellow, uh, fr an immigrator from India. Uh, and uh, he was interested in uh, the thyroid. Uh, he was working on developing a thyroxine assay, and Dr. Skowski a, a uh, vasopressin assay, uh, and uh, Dr. Dusso a tritothyronine assay. Uh, and we had the, the chemical thyroxine assay that we'd used in Arkansas that we used in the interim before we got ready amino assays running. Hmm. Uh, so uh, that defined uh, uh, those areas of, of perinatal research at the time and we submitted research grants for those and every time we had a new opportunity we'd, we'd submit a grant to the NIH so that we could expand the, the activities and that worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, so when Dr. Dusso decided to go back to uh, Quebec, uh, uh, he decided, uh, and we decided, uh, since the T4 assay was clearly going to develop and we had preliminary data, and uh, Dr. Chopra finally finalized it, uh, to uh, apply it uh, to newborn screening. Quebec had a newborn screening program. Following Jean Dusso's return to Quebec, what work were you doing? We had just finished uh, characterizing fetal and newborn thyroid function uh, in some detail and decided uh, that uh, there were options for uh, newborn screening. And Quebec had established a newborn screening program for phenylketonuria uh, some few years before, uh, and it was uh, about to, to uh, they were in a bit of trouble because uh, it, that's one in 15,000 or so births. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't very cost effective. Uh, and uh, so they agreed uh, because we thought at that time that the prevalence of congenital hypothyroidism was about one in 6,000 uh, so that it would increase the efficiency of the screening program. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Dusso uh, took the uh, embryo thyroxine immunoassay uh, to, uh, back with him to Quebec, and uh, the screening for phenylketonuria was done using little fil filter paper blood spots uh, from the uh, heel from the newborn infant. Uh, and he developed a method for measuring T4 in the blood spots published that in 1973, I think, uh, <clears throat> and started to apply it to the screening program and uh, published the first newborn screening in 1975, uh, 
Uh, he, he, by then they'd screened 47,000 infants uh, and they found one in 6,714 births. And uh, so the screening programs were established. Uh, we had a Kroc Foundation uh, uh, meeting that uh, Bob Kroc uh, funded for us in, uh, in uh, California and uh, invited some other thyroidologists to, to come uh, and talked about newborn thyroid function and, and Jean's screening results. And uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, there had been a study of, of thyroid screening measuring cord blood, but that was a rather clumsy and it didn't work and they didn't have a program. Uh, so uh, that broke up uh, and Jean's publication in 75 stimulated a lot of interest. Uh, and uh, there were newborn screening programs then established in the northeast, northeast United States in Boston uh, that screened uh, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, in the Northwest United States, they had a screening program in, in uh, Portland that was screening Oregon, Alaska, Idaho, Montana, and, and Nebraska. And uh, they introduced the newborn thyroid screening there. Uh, we set up an American Thyroid Association screening committee uh, that I chaired, uh, and Dr. Dussault and Dr. Uh, Reed Larson, Dr. Evelyn Mann, Dr. Paul Walfish, uh, and I, I, Dr. Dorothy Hollingsworth, I think I mentioned, I may have missed it. There were six people in the committee in any case. Uh, and uh, the intent was to review what had gone on in these uh, several programs in Boston and Portland and Quebec uh, and Pittsburgh and uh, decided that uh, newborn screening seemed to be an effective way to deal with congenital hypothyroidism. Uh, so uh, uh, the ATA gave its blessing, I guess you might say. And uh, so there were other pe people interested as well, and uh, there was a rather rapid expansion of newborn screening uh, to Europe and Austra Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Israel. Uh, and in the committee uh, put together a report on, uh, on uh, screening the first one million North American infants uh, in uh, these five laboratories uh, and and reported that it was one in uh, about 3,500 newborns uh, and uh, we all were participating in developing uh, uh, information about how to treat these infants, uh, how soon they should be treated, how they should be studied when they were detected, uh, how to get rid of uh, false positive tests, uh, enormous uh, a series of questions that came up that everybody began to focus on. Uh, and uh, so we set up an international screening committee. Uh, myself and Dr. Dussault and Dr. Burrow from the United States, Dr. Francois Delange from Belgium, a good friend, Dr. Morial de Escobar uh, from Spain, uh, Dr. Urier and Dr. Nerussier from Japan, and Dr. John Connolly from Australia. And over the next uh, night, we, we set over the next few years, we set up screening meetings uh, in Quebec in '79, in Tokyo in '82, in Brussels in '88, uh, to deal with all of these issues in newborn screening and try to come to some conclusions about uh, or proposals about how to how to deal with them. Uh, and uh, by that time, uh, newborn screening, of course, was was salvaged uh, with the one in 3,000 versus the one in 15,000 uh, and uh, it's been supported and expanded uh, in the in the United States now by the government uh, government support uh, and they're now screening of course for some 30 newborn defects uh, that uh, are benefited by early detection and treatment uh, it's it's been a highly success, successful program what 
later studies were you doing on fetal thyroid metabolism? Well, we started uh, measuring thyroid hormone production rates in the fetus. And uh, we measured uh, thyroxine production rate, uh, and it was about 40 micrograms per kilogram per day, and it blew us away because, uh, the, you know, after birth, the secretion rate is, is uh, one-sixth or something of that. Uh, and we measured the uh, triterothyronine production rate, and uh, it was minimal. Uh, triterothyronine levels were extremely low, and, and at best the production rate would be two micrograms per kilogram per day. So that all of the thyroxine in the fetus was being converted to something else, uh, and not making active thyroid hormone. So uh, we... Dr. Adi and Dr. Hobel and a uh, new fellow, Dan Polk, uh, and Inder Chopra, and, uh, and a new collaborator, Dr. Uh, Jimmy Wu at the uh, University of Irvine, uh, began to focus on what those other things were that we weren't measuring. Uh, it was a several year project, uh, work in the lab uh, over the 70s and early 80s, uh, and there was work going on about thyroid metabolism, not necessarily in the fetus, but uh, in general. Uh, and uh, there, it had been, it was being worked out that there were two methods of degradation. One, deiodination. Thyroxine has four iodines on the molecule, and you take off that one critical one, uh, and it then it, the thyroid hormone binds to its receptor and does its thing. If you remove any other of the iodines, it inactivates the, the molecule. And so there, there's, it turned out there were three deiodinases, one, two, and three, uh, that r removed uh, uh, different uh, iodines, and I'll get to that. The other uh, degradation system was sulfation, uh, putting a sulfate in a hydroxyl position at the end of the molecule, and it became inactive. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we developed assays uh, for uh, sulfated thyroxine and assays for the reverse T3, which was removing one iodine atom to inactivate the molecule, and uh, found that the levels were pretty high in the fetus. And we did production rates, uh, uh, but it turned out that the reverse T3, the deiodinated one, was still only five micrograms per kilogram per day. Uh, so the deiodination pathway certainly wasn't the most prominent. So we developed an amino assay for T4 sulfate. And uh, T4 sulfate and reverse T3 sulfate were half of the, the 40 micrograms per kilogram per day. Uh, and we went on and then developed uh, assays for the rest of the of the metabolites in the system. Uh, uh, the, the deiodination pathway is reverse T3 and uh, T2 and T1 and T0, T for thyronine molecule. Uh, and for the sulfate, uh, thyroxine sulfate, T4 sulfate, uh, T3 sulfate, reverse T3 sulfate, T2 sulfate, and T1 sulfate. Uh, and as I said, the sulfate compounds uh, made up most of the production rate uh, in the fetus. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the serum and the production rate studies showed that the combined sulfation and deiodination pathways amounted to 90% of the, of the compounds that were floating around in the fetus. Uh, the, it, it turns out that the deiodinase enzymes uh, were, were doing this as well as sulfate. The type 1 deiodinase converts thyroxine to triterothyronine in the liver and other tissues, and there was very little of that in the fetus. Uh, type 2 deiodinase uh, is present in brain and converts thyroxine to triterothyronine, and it's present there. And the type 3 is in placenta and other tissues, and it does the rest of the inactivation. So the fetus had lots of type 3 uh, monodeiodinase uh, that reversed, that, that 
that went down the deionation pathway and uh, the type 2 in the brain was there to convert thyroxine to triterthionine uh, because the fetal brain, if it doesn't have thyroid hormone, uh, doesn't develop normally. And so it turns out uh, that the system set up to inactivate uh, thyroxine except in the brain, which requires uh, thyroxine for normal development. Uh, the inactivation presumably is to, to uh, promote growth in the fetus. The thyroxine is a catabolic hormone. It causes an increase in metabolic rate, and uh, so it would probably impair growth, but that's just a hypothesis. But the whole system in the fetus is vastly different than it is in the, in the actually in the newborn period in the adult, and uh, that transition occurs in the last uh, uh, five to eight weeks of pregnancy and in the newborn period. What led you to study carbohydrate metabolism? Well, I, the carbohydrate studies came about because newborns develop hypoglycemia. Uh, fairly, well, they all do, and it's just a question of degree. Uh, as you cut off the glucose and the other nutrients from the mother when you cut the umbilical cord, uh, they're then on their own. And uh, they normally, and they have some liver glycogen carbohydrate stores. And epinephrine and uh, glucagon will stimulate release of that. Uh, there's plenty of uh, epinephrine uh, release in the fetus, uh, uh, as, as we'll find out. Uh, but uh, we developed immunoassays, Dr. Pfizer, uh, an early fellow from Arkansas, uh, to look at uh, insulin and, and uh, Dr. Sperling, who I'd recruited from Pittsburgh to, uh, as a pediatric endocrinologist, was interested in diabetes, and I wasn't so interested in diabetes. He developed the uh, glucagon assay, and uh, they worked together to look at insulin and glucon. And, gone in the newborn infant in the perinatal research unit and in the, in the sheep lab. And it turns out that uh, insulin and glucagon are minimally secreted in the fetus. The mother provides glucose and the fetus doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, if, if there's hypoglycemia, mother's system would respond. Uh, so that system has to then change in the newborn period. And it takes uh, several days for the glucagon release system, the insulin glucagon control system for, for regulating glucose to mature in the newborn period after suppression in utero. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it turns out that insulin and glucagon ratio is what is most important in regulating glucose levels. Uh, so that system of evolution, uh, 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 evolutionary system in the fetus uh, in terms of endocrine ontogenesis, much different than the thyroid. It turns out that each of these systems has a, has a function in the fetus and it has to change where the baby's born. Uh, uh, and uh, this was intriguing from that regard. But we, we were also studying catecholamine metabolism. Uh, we, we, it turned out it wasn't possible to, uh, to develop immunoassays effectively for the catecholamines. And so they're, they're radioenzymatic assays that we're still using, uh, that we're in the process of changing these days. Uh, but we set up those uh, assays for epinephrine and norepinephrine and dopamine uh, and uh, started looking at responses uh, in the in the infants and the, and the sheep. Uh, and we looked at responses to maternal exercise and uh, hypoxia in the fetus. Uh, obviously, these things in the sheep. Uh, and acidosis uh, and hypotension uh, uh, and looked at the metabolic clearance of the hormones in the fetus. Uh, uh, it uh, and developed a number of insights about this system as well. The, the, Actually, norepinephrine secretion, uh, which comes from the ganglia, uh, the autonomic ganglia, and uh, epinephrine, which comes from the, the 
autonomic uh, center within the adrenal gland secretes epinephrine, uh, and uh, epinephrine secretion is significantly less in the fetus than norepinephrine because it's almost a direct neural response to a stimulus. Uh, so norepinephrine secretion exceeds epinephrine in the newborn uh, as by way of direct secretion from the autonomic ganglia. Uh, epinephrine secretion from the adrenal uh, increases more slowly with age. Uh, epinephrine infusion, uh, interestingly, uh, and Dr. Skowski was involved, stimulates vasopressin secretion. We were looking at both because they were res uh, stress response systems. Uh, and it turns out AVP, arginine vasopressin, from the pituitary uh, acts to stimulate uh, uh, act as a corticosterone releasing hormone to increase uh, cortisone secretion as well. Uh, so this fetal response system, uh, catecholamines, uh, vasopressin, and uh, cortisol, uh, is uh, all of these are activated in concert in the fetus, and that isn't true after birth. Uh, it's, uh, and all that presumably is to potentiate the fetal stress response uh, and, and provide uh, these critical hormones that are optimal for, op, op, optimal for uh, I'm sorry, to provide optimal levels of stress response uh, to get the fetus into the extrauterine environment through the labor process. Uh, so it's another pattern of endocrine systems development uh, different from uh, from insulin, glucagon, and thyroid uh, that, that was intriguing. Would you give a little background about water metabolism in the fetus and the newborn? Yes, it's much different uh, than it is after birth. In the fetus, there are two large water compartments, one the fetal compartment and the other the amniotic fluid. Uh, and uh, there, their fetal lung fluid, uh, there's no air in the lung, but there's water in the lung, uh, and it flows out of the lung into the amniotic fluid. And there is a fetal kidney that that beginning to function, uh, and uh, will so the infant can uh, urinate into amniotic fluid. And there's transfer back from the fetus to the mother. Uh, it can go either way, uh, depending upon the circumstances. Uh, so uh, the fetus uh, is, is uh, part of the mother, and uh, uh, it, it turns out uh, that uh, the amniotic fluid volume is about 650 milliliters. The fetal lung uh, produces about 250 milliliters of, of fluid a day. The fetal urine is about 600 milligram, milli, uh, <laughs> ml per, per day. Uh, the fetus swallows amniotic fluid, and it, it swallows about 500 ml a day. Uh, so in that uh, exchange, uh, the difference is about uh, 350 ml a day that, that isn't accounted for. Uh, and probably that's the bulk flow from the amniotic fluid into the mother. Uh, so the system's pretty well defined. Uh, uh, and of course, we wondered uh, how does uh, how do the hormones that regulate water and electrolyte after birth involved in this system? So we developed AVP and AVT, arginine vasopressin and arginine vasotocin assays. There, they, those two uh, uh, peptide hormones differ just in one amino acid. Uh, and, and we did a variety of studies to perturb the system to see how, the, what, how they responded, and we measured uh, uh, AVP and AVT uh, and urine, uh, urine and amniotic fluid osmolality and other things. Uh, uh, and it turns out uh, a, there's no AVT, by the way, uh, in, uh, in mammalian species, in humans uh, after birth. Uh, it's... Uh, but it's present in about the same amounts as AVP in the fetus, uh, and it's uh, it's uh, lower species uh, have AVT as their vaso as their vasopressin hormone. Uh, 
but uh, the fetus continues to secrete it, and uh, I guess it's to uh, to I- increase the efficiency or something. Uh, it's 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 uh, ontogeny, recapitulating phylogeny, or something of the sort. In any case, uh, uh, the levels are higher than we expected. Uh, and it turns out that uh, AVP and AVT decrease the fetal to maternal flow across the placenta, that uh, decreases the lung flow into am- amniotic fluid, and increases urine osmolality as it does after birth, uh, and decreases urine flow into amniotic fluid. Uh, we also looked at atrial natriuretic factor. It's a hormone uh, that's involved in fluid metabolism secreted by the heart. Uh, and it's present in the fetus, and it decreases the lung flow into amniotic fluid. Uh, And we looked at prolactin, uh, which uh, is uh, minimally involved, uh, uh, and it decreases amniotic fluid uh, uh, flow into the uh, maternal compartment. Uh, And and plasma renin activity, which is, uh, it controls sodium, uh, electrolyte release decreases urine flow in response to volume depletion. So it's an entirely different system than it is uh, after birth. Uh, uh, the defense of blood volume and cardiovascular function, uh, lung fluid, uh, amniotic fluid and renal function uh, uh, are, are mo- controlled in the fetus by the interac- interaction of arginine vasopressin, arginine vasotocin, uh, atrial natriuretic factor, uh, prolactin, and to some degree uh, uh, cortisol uh, in the third generation fetal sheep, uh, third gestation, excuse me, fetal sheep. Uh, and, and so the, res- the, the system kind of resembles the catechol stress pattern. Uh, that is collaborative endocrine systems uh, to, to meet fetal needs and to meet the problems of neonatal adaptation. Uh, that too was pretty interesting. How did your interest in growth factors come about? Well, endocrinology uh, is, uh, is growth and development uh, in large part because of the growth hormone from the pituitary. Uh, And uh, growth hormone uh, has been shown by uh, Dr. Dowaday to uh, years ago to have its effect by stimulating insulin-like growth factor uh, from from the liver and other tissues uh, that that uh, cause stimulate the growth and development. Uh, interestingly, IGF one and IGF two, the insulinic growth factors, are present in the fetus, uh, but they're not regulated by growth hormone. And it turns out it's mostly nutrition uh, that regulates it. Uh, if the fetus is adequately fed, it'll grow faster by stimulating IGFs. Uh, and if there isn't so much food available, it doesn't grow so fast. Uh, so, uh, and, and we postulated that, uh, well, the other important ingredient is that thyroid hormone, which with growth hormone is responsible for growth uh, after birth. Uh, has little effect on on growth in the fetus. It becomes important at birth, and it's all inactivated anyway, as we've discussed. So uh, we we were postulating that uh, that other growth factors may be involved uh, in the thyroid hormone effect uh, or other hormone effects, uh, and. Uh, it, it, there is information about a variety of, of growth factors that are active in the fetus. Uh, epidermal growth factor is one, and nerve growth factor is another. Uh, so we decided to, uh, to uh, look at, at these two systems uh, 
and we developed assays for EGF and NGF, but nobody had purified sheep EGF or NGF. So uh, uh, we couldn't produce an assay. Uh, we, had, we had mouse hormones, and so we produced immunoassays for the mouse and used the mouse bottle. Uh, that had the added advantage that it's easier to study tissues uh, and it's easier to do treatments, and it doesn't cost so much and uh, you can see the effects sooner. Uh, so uh, we looked at EGF in skin and brain and lung and submandibular salivary gland uh, and, and there were high levels uh, and, and lower levels in other tissues but it was widely distributed. And uh, thyroxin treatment increased EGF in these tissues uh, and uh, Thyroxin treatment increased, increased NGF in the brain and the submandibular gland and the kidney. Uh, that doesn't imply uh, that, that it's influencing uh, in the human fetus or the sheep fetus. Uh, uh, when we look at the, at the mouse, so we're looking at the, essentially the third trimester of fetus in the extrauterine period. Uh, so that uh, the, the fetal mouse is born uh, as, as an embryo still, almost, and it has to be warmed and fed and, uh, until it, it matures significantly and, and it grows, and, and these growth factors uh, and thyroxin it, in that model and in that period seem to be influencing growth by way of, of EGF as well as probably other growth factors. Uh, so there is support for a role for EGF and NGF in, in meeting thy, thyroxin effects and, uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, in, probably in the late part of pregnancy and in the early neonatal period and, and, and later. Uh, we did studies of epidermal growth factor mRNA, the gene products uh, in the SMG and kidney. And Dr. Uh, Luciano Barajas in the, our, in, the, in the pathology department was very interested. He's a nephrologist uh, kind of uh, pathologist, does the kidney pathology. And uh, he did uh, studies of uh, in vitro hybridization looking at message and uh, and, and uh, looking at EGF and electron microscopy to see where it was in the kidney and the submandibular gland. Uh, and uh, to make the story short, uh, the EGF and, and, and the EGF prohormone are present in saliva and urine. Uh, <clears throat> EGF responds to thyroxine treatment uh, in both. Testosterone is also important in the salivary gland, so it's a dual control. Uh, but all of this work uh, support the hypothesis, our, our suggestion that the submandibular gland and the kidney EGF uh, are there to provide EGF to maintain the surface integrity of your gut on the one hand uh, and your urinary tract on the other. Uh, and you, you know from your own life that if you get a cut inside your mouth or damage it with with biting too hard on something that it rapidly heals and that's from salivary gland EGF and the EGF that this kidney manufactures in the kidney tubules uh, does the same maintenance for the urinary tract uh, uh, so uh, now they're these are both large areas of, of research uh, and, and they're interesting because there are a number of hormones involved in these uh, various times in various tissues uh, regulating these, these and other growth factors. Uh, that too was interesting. Okay, I would like to ask you a little bit about the Nichols Institute, uh, Quest Diagnostics. Is yes. Uh, you became president of the reference laboratories of Nichols Institute, Quest, in 1991. Uh, maybe you could tell me a little bit about the Institute and Dr. Albert Nichols. Well, Dr. Nichols uh, is an endocrinologist, 
he finished his training uh, in Boston with Dr. Melby, whom I knew from Arkansas. And he came back to California. His father uh, and the family were uh, in the heavy construction business. Actually, his father built uh, oil islands off of, off of Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, Al uh, decided to go into medicine and endocrinology, and he came back to work for Kaiser uh, Hospital nearby us. And he'd come over to Wednesday Endocrine Clinic. And uh, we were by then uh, using our assays to manage the patients there, the, our hormone assays. Uh, and he was very interested in that, uh, and he wanted to use those for his patients at Kaiser. So he arranged to set up a lab, and uh, we arranged to set up the assays for him, uh, the ones applicable to the human, thyroxin, uh, and cortisol, and estrogen, and testosterone, and et cetera, uh, seven or eight of them. And uh, uh, he began to use them and was very excited about it. Uh, uh, he, uh, the Kaiser physicians have to make a decision about whether they're going to stay on with Kaiser after two years. They have a two-year trial period. Uh, and uh, he, the, the pathologists there, uh, the laboratory weren't so happy with his laboratory. Uh, and uh, I guess he decided he would, he'd set up his own laboratory. Uh, and he thought that these kinds of assays weren't available elsewhere and that uh, if he created a laboratory, a commercial laboratory, he could, uh, he could uh, develop them for clinical use. Uh, and his, uh, his goal was to uh, make the, uh, the, the systems available in the research lab available to the clinician for patient care. And so he started the Nichols uh, Institute for Endocrinology uh, and uh, in a garage nearby. Uh, and we, Dr. Odell and, and I helped him out and Dr. Uh, Horton from USC who did steroid assays uh, and uh, the growth and hormone and pituitary assays Dr. Hotel helped out with and the vasopressin and the action ones we, thyroxin that we were dealing with, we helped set up in the laboratory. Uh, and uh, we were UCLA faculty and uh, we couldn't invest in the laboratory and wouldn't have anyway. Uh, but he decided he'd make us what he called academic associates, I guess consultants. And, uh, and he supported some technicians in our laboratory uh, to help out with all of this. Uh, and uh, so we got involved uh, as, as consultants to the laboratory, uh, and it, it grew rapidly. And he was a good businessman, and his father uh, in the construction business helped him build a new laboratory and modify one in Long Beach, and he outgrew that and then developed a bigger one in, in, in uh, San Juan Capistrano. Uh, and he, it expanded, uh, and he started then to introduce other tests uh, with the same arrangement with academic associates transferring or helping transfer uh, exciting new assays uh, to the laboratory uh, in uh, genetics uh, and, and in uh, uh, immunology. Uh, interestingly, uh, the immunoassays were important in immunology. In endocrinology, you used an antibody to measure a hormone. And in immunology, you, you use a, a, a product uh, to measure an antibody. It, it may be a hormone if it's an antibody in the patient to a hormone, uh, but it can be an, <coughs> an antibody to, to anything else. And, and uh, so it's the reverse of a, a routine uh, immunoassay. Uh, th so it, it the, the whole uh, radioimmunoassay uh, uh, business rapidly expanded into immunology. Uh, it, uh, and, and that part of the laboratory grew rapidly. Uh, and so he, he, the volume got so large that he then had to start creating regional laboratories. Uh, that would set up the commoner assays and send the rest to San Juan Capistrano. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that worked quite well. Uh, it uh, it was in nineteen the early nineteen ninety one that Al contacted me, uh, and his uh, his uh, reference laboratory. Uh, exec had uh, decided to go back to Colorado and go into horse business. And he asked me if I wanted to come and run the reference laboratory. And I'd just gotten a new NIH grant and a, 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 a special award with it. Uh, and I said uh, I didn't think I wanted to leave what I was doing. and. Uh, he came back to me uh, a couple of times later, and I went down and visited with him. And he he had a the whole new laboratory in San Juan Capistrano just about completed. Uh, it was an impressive uh, edifice, I might say, and uh, the intrigue of uh, expanding uh, into other areas of endocrinology and understanding same uh, uh, immunology as well. Uh, uh, oncology uh, was uh, interesting, and so I decided I'd uh, try it. So I, in, in uh, the spring of 91, I became uh, president of the reference laboratory. Uh, but that lasted only two years. Uh, that was, you know, as president of the reference laboratory, it's, it's largely HR issues. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, so Al put one of the other medical directors in charge of the laboratory and, and uh, made me the, uh, the, uh, the uh, head of the academic associates and, and uh, the R&D program. Uh, so that's what I started to do uh, and uh, began to recruit uh, medical directors to head those laboratories and uh, and uh, that was uh, uh, an exciting uh, new option uh, and and that's what you mean by referring to it as a virtual medical school is that yes I at one time, we had 40 academic associates from the various academic institutes uh, in, in, in the country, in enterprises in the country. Uh, and uh, by then, we'd, we'd created the, uh, this uh, division of uh, endocrinology, the division of immunology, the division of genetics, the division of oncology, the division of uh, infectious disease, uh, uh, the Division of Toxicology, uh, a comprehensive reference lab. Uh, about 60% of the assays in, in the whole operation were radioimmunoassays. So uh, the radioimmunoassay absolutely transformed some of these laboratory operations. Uh, uh, and uh, so that that some of the academicians that were involved in various areas of, of medicine were interested in what was going on in terms of providing assays uh, commercially to uh, physicians. And uh, so uh, there was a lot of interaction. Uh, it, uh, it seemed like a medical school. I had 40 people out there that I communicated with and that we communicated with. And, and the, the, uh, the medical directors and the research staff uh, that were doing the R&D uh, and then a, a separate uh, uh, medical director uh, for the laboratory that, that took care of the operations. Uh, and we set it up so that the uh, medical directors got uh, half their salary from operations for supervising the day-to-day -day conduct of testing and half their uh, salaries uh, from R&D, running the R&D staff, to make sure they always had new assays online and with the academic associates behind them. So it made for a, a kind of a virtual medical school, it seemed. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Endocrine Society now. Yes. 
What has the Endocrine Society meant to you in terms of community? Well, it's, it's been uh, my major uh, contact uh, with the whole of endocrinology. Uh, I was involved uh, in the program for the Endocrine Society uh, for many years. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism for five years. Uh, I became president of the Endocrine Society in 1983. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I've been involved uh, academically now for uh, 40 plus years. Uh, and, and it's uh, Initially, when I was president, uh, Nettie Carpen was uh, running the Endocrine Society, it, it, and she used to work at the at the NIH, I think, for for and with Griff Ross. Uh, and the Endocrine Society initially was kind of an endocrine club, uh, and uh, it. Uh, the need for its uh, its survival and growth has become obvious in the fact that it uh, it uh, has uh, become a, the most uh, influential and the largest endocrine uh, what shall I call it? It's not a club, the largest endocrine enterprise uh, in terms of uh, of uh, teaching and and. Uh, providing information about endocrinology to uh, all sorts of, of clients and, 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 and uh, audiences, uh, myself included. Uh, I also belong to the Thyroid Association and the Pediatric Endocrine Society, uh, but uh, that's just thyroid, and that's just pediatrics. Uh, there are the other societies that have split off the most uh, recently the American Association for Clinical Endocrinology that uh, was an issue when I was president and that's, uh, that was created a few years I've forgotten what year was created 85 or 6 something in that in that era uh, to link up with and provide more uh, direct support of practicing endocrinologists in terms of of, uh, of uh, business acumen and and uh, and uh, support for political and other needs that the endocrine society hadn't been providing before. It was a more elitist society interested in just research and uh, and and. You know, initially, uh, the Endocrine Society way back was was pretty much uh, a, as I say, a, a club kind of environment for academic endocrinologists. Uh, and now, of course, it's vastly more than that as the need became uh, uh, clear. Uh, and I've I've enjoyed the expansion and been involved uh, with all of it. And uh, over the time, over time. Uh, uh, I find it uh, the most effective uh, uh, source of information and, and, and uh, constant stimulation uh, that is available to me. Uh, the thyroid and pediatric I attend, and uh, but it's it's not the same. It's not the comprehensive coverage of endocrinology that otherwise is provided by the Endocrine Society. Thank you.